Hello everyone and welcome to the TNT Show. I'm John Drummond and as is the case every week, I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. And again, I want to say thanks to you. The TNT Show and Indie Live are growing and delivering more exciting shows than ever before. I hope at least some of you will be able to catch up on Marcus Chown on the Scottish Food Show. I mean, the list is almost endless. It puts the BBC to shame what Kevin Gibney and his team have been able to achieve on an absolutely shoestring budget. So if you think this show and others are worthy of help, go to the Indie Live Net for details, put someone into the Crowdfinder, you'll find the details on the screen shortly. You know, it's been another great day for democracy. We learned that Downing 10th Street, as we must call it, has been called Party Central for the number and range of parties that took place while thousands died. Thanks for joining us this evening. Tonight we'll be talking to Kenny McCaskill, MP. And you know, with the latest antics at Westminster, plus the most recent opinion polls and the relationship between the SNP and Alaba ahead of the council elections and looking forward, there's lots and lots to talk about. There's ferries to talk about. <laughs> There's a great raft of things. Stay with us. This is going to be a very entertaining show. And Kenny is here for a full hour. And you'll be taking your questions live. There's still time to get your questions considered. You'll find the details on the screen. TNT, of course, stands for the Nation Talks. So in many respects, as I always say, this is your show. We're live and we're free. So no license. No problem. Now, to our guest tonight, the Nation Talks to Kenny McCaskill. Kenny, how are you? Oh, very well, thank you. And you're, you're joining us from where tonight? I'm back up in Aberlour. I've been down in Dunbar in London, and now I've come up for a, for a brief sojourn before I depart to the Central Belt again. Right. So who's looking after business for Alaba while well, you're... Well, Neil and I take it week about, although he had COVID, so I was two weeks in the trot. Neil's down in Neil's down in Westminster this week, and I'm in Scotland. Uh, then recess, and that will be my turn. But uh, we share it, tag team. When one's down in London, the other's up here. And uh, with elections coming, and indeed the necessity to be campaigning for independence, uh, we're busy, probably busier in Scotland than we would be in Westminster. There's, there's something I've got to ask you. I asked Neil this question, and I want to ask it of you as well, Kenny. If you're an independent supporter, but you're not political in the sense of being party political, you just want independence for Scotland. And you look at the SAP and you look at Alaba and you think to yourself, I don't understand this, guys. I'm sure you have very good reasons for being the way you are and doing what you do. I just don't get it. And what puzzles them in particular is that they're going to the polling station soon for the council elections. And at some stage, hopefully in the near future, they'll be going to the polling stations for a general election or a referendum. Or, and, and the question, perhaps not a referendum in that case, but the question that must be uppermost in their minds is, what, how do I decide here? I mean, because it seems to me there's never a split vote. And, and what could happen as a result of my split vote the decision I take as an ordinary voter uh, could allow the Unionist Party in. Uh, how, how would you respond to that? Uh, well, it won't. This is an STV election. Uh, you're voting one, two, three, and indeed the older days that you vote until you vote. The uh, Alba Party is quite clear. We are suggesting that you vote Alba one. Uh, and then you vote for an independent supporting party uh, too. Uh, and if there's more than one independent supporting party, then you rank them as you see fit. Uh, so there's uh, no suggestion and no way uh, that the ALBA vote, or indeed any of the other independent supporting parties, actually impedes the other. Uh, what you have to do is to make sure that you transfer, uh, as indeed we see now in regularly in STV elections where uh, the unionists transfer from Tory to Labour or Labour to Tory. Uh, so so this is about transferring of votes. Equally, I think it's normal in many countries where there's uh, independence cause that you have more than one political party. Scotland yeah. was quite unique in some ways in just having the SNP. Equally, we all campaign whether you're in a political party, because let's also remember, many more people are in the independence movement than are in any political party 
whether SNP, ALBA, ISP, SSP or anything combined. Uh, what matters is the cause. Uh, those of us within ALBA, such as myself, take the view that, first of all, there are issues about why we found the SNP unacceptable regarding internal democracy. But perhaps more importantly, we also think there's a radical cause to be pushed that if we are going to persuade people for independence, then it has to be a radical perspective. And sadly, in various issues, the Scottish government has been far from radical, uh, not simply in terms of the policies, but in terms of the failure to push for a referendum or indeed to use the mandates that have been given to them in every election since 2015. Do you think there's going to be a referendum soon? No. Uh, I think the timescale has now run out, and indeed I never believed it. When I was first elected back in 2019, I was at meetings in which Ian Blackford was talking about a referendum in 2020. Frankly, he knew he was telling porkies, and the rest of us knew it as well. We're now into the almost approaching April of 2022. To have a referendum sometime, presumably no later than October 2023, is virtually impossible. You only have to look at the timetable you're required by uh, the Electoral Commission, where you've got to have at least six month campaigning period. That takes you back until the spring of 2023. We've not even got started. So there was never any intention by the SNP leadership of having a referendum. They'll now use the excuse that it's Ukraine or something else, but there ain't going to be a referendum in 2023. Uh, and all the suggestion that we got from various SNP MPs that vote SNP because Boris Johnson is going to blink. It hasn't been Boris Johnson who's blinked. It's been Ian Blackford and Nicola Sturgeon. Do you think that Boris Johnson would ever agree to a referendum? I think in the foreseeable future, no. Uh, the opportunity was there and should have been used by the SNP leadership to have you know, run a consultative referendum. That was always possible. But the position taken by Nicola Sturgeon of requiring a gold-plated Section 30 referendum was insanity. The legal advice that you know, well, we're all privy to that could have been challenged in the court was that a consultative referendum could have been it could have been carried out. It wouldn't have had the weight of a Section 30, but it would have been the perspective and opinion of the Scottish people. Uh, that option, to some extent, is closed, not because it's not been tested in court, but because the unionists have wisened up to it and they've said they would boycott it. So I think, to some extent, what could have been done and should have been done, you know, if the Tories have rejected, as they might have, a referendum in 2017, 2018 or 2019, there should just have been a consultative referendum that would have shown the world that the people of Scotland were fed up and weren't taking it. That wasn't used. Now the likelihood of a boycott means that that door's probably closed. And what we have to look at is what Alba's arguing, which is for a convention. Let's get the elected representatives of Scotland together. That should have been done immediately after the election in 2019 because Scotland did not vote for Boris Johnson yet again. We haven't voted for a Tory government since before I was born. We should have convened a referendum of MPs, MSPs, and indeed leading figures in local government to say, this is simply unobtainable. And what the basis of that should have been and what must that be, because I think that's still the way ahead, what that should be is to say, where does sovereignty lie? Does it lie in Westminster where they say no, or does it lie in the elected representatives who have a mandate from the people of Scotland who say this ain't acceptable? And it's then for the convention to set the direction of path for negotiations as we then take actions, whether in court, whether diplomatically, whether internationally, or whether in demonstrations on the streets and in our communities. But the convention is path to gather together opinion in Scotland of not just political parties, but as indeed wider Scottish people to give us that legitimacy and to so, make so sure that. that so sorry, this on effectively, go. would be a, 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 a repeat in some respects of the the convention that was held that led to the Scotland Act. I think you have to, you know, lay credit that uh, uh, that laid the basis, and I think we've got to do that. You know, we're out an impasse. Westminster's saying no. Scotland is saying something entirely different, and that's why, as they, I think, you then pull the people of Scotland together to say this declares our legitimacy. That gives us legitimacy. I see a question about legal matters. I don't think that we're going to get a great deal of success through the courts. At the end of the day, the nature of the court system now that uh, we're part of the Supreme Court, you'll end up there. Even if you were to get a victory in the Scottish courts, which I very much doubt, because they would simply say that we're part of a, a British state, that would take us there. That's why I think you need the political legitimacy. Although I think having arguments about where sovereignty lies 
which goes back historically in the history of Scotland, as I was, you know, told by Lord Justice Cooper, not that I was told personally by Lord Justice Cooper, it predates me, but in my law classes, uh, sovereignty rests with the Scottish people. So you use that legal basis, but it has to be done politically, and the political method has to be the convention. So, but the convention, uh, I mean, uh, Kenyon Wright was a, a, a close friend of mine, uh, and uh, it seemed to me that the reason that the convention worked back then was in part, maybe large part, down to his chairmanship, if, if not leadership. Uh, the SNP, i.e. the main independence party, opted out of that, he, he re always reminded me. So it was actually a, a convention which didn't really represent the Scottish people. <laughs> Well, I think, it, to be fair, I mean, I, I was part of the SNP at that time, and indeed, you know, I remember taking the decision. We didn't go into the convention because we felt that uh, independence was being excluded. And indeed, it was being excluded as an option. And on that basis, you know, I, I think the SNP was entitled to do that. Equally, that convention laid, did lay the basis. But let's remember that what also delivered devolution in Scotland was the fear that the Scottish people would vote SNP for independence. That was ultimately what delivered Tony Blair. Not the convention, not uh, reasonable arguments, not that he believed in devolution since, you know, he didn't seem to think it mattered any more than the weather system in the Himalayas or something, as I recall. What mattered was that there was a fear that Scotland was going to do something different. That's why I think this convention will be different because the context, the timing and everything's different. That's not to denigrate what Kenyon Wright did. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the SNP decision was understandable at the time, but this is a different time and that's why I think you know we need another convention to move us forward from the basis of the parliament that we have because to some extent the basis of this convention should be to declare that the sovereign parliament isn't Westminster the sovereign parliament is Holyrood. And let's say there is such a convention uh, what would happen if the SNP opted out? Well, I think if the SNP opt out, then it makes it difficult for the convention to really motor. Equally, I think it would also show that the SNP had no intention of taking Scotland forward. Questions would legitimately be asked by many who have remained membership, but perhaps retain membership uh, more in hope than perhaps expectation. Uh, I think that would be the end of any expectations. And I think they would also have to answer to the people of Scotland why in early 2020, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, even before COVID, said that convention would be a good thing, but it's a bit like a commitment to a referendum. We ain't seen no referendum. We haven't seen any convention. It's just yet more platitudes. So I think that's something in which I think the people of Scotland and those in the independence movement would find simply inexplicable. If there is a convention, the SNP required to be there. If they're not there, then questions has to be asked about just how serious they are about taking Scotland forward because okay. it doesn't see any other way. If, if, uh, assuming that the... Uh convention idea is is, is realised. Uh, it, it does rather depend on getting as broad a swathe of Scottish opinion represented as you can possibly contrive, because I assume at the end of the day that you would then have to go to the international community and say, look, we did this thing. We think it asserts our sovereignty. But somewhere along the way, that would have to be agreed that that contention would have to be agreed by others. Otherwise, it, it, it wouldn't have substance, if you know what I mean. It, of course, it would have substance in an ideal sense, in a moral sense, but in a terms of real politic, you really need to get... I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back to the Declaration of Our Growth. I mean, what happened there was that the, the, the commitment was then sent to the Pope for his endorsement in order that it could be regarded as having the appropriate status to go forward. You would have to have to do that again, wouldn't you, if, it, if the result, assuming the result was positive in the sense of saying we, we declare this to be an independent sovereign state. Somebody along the line would have to agree to that outside of Scotland. Well, no, because at the end of the day, this is all about real politique. This is about ultimately the relationship between Scotland and uh, the rest of the UK. I mean, the role of the international world, I think, would be to pressurise the UK for a settlement. But it's 100 years on since the Doyle era, and, you know, who were the elected representatives of the people of Ireland who then established their own uh, Doyle, rather than going to Westminster, uh, decided that Ireland was going to secede. I don't think we required to go through a war of independence as they did, but the international community 
ultimately, you know, and especially the United States brought Britain to uh, recognise that this simply wasn't acceptable. So at the end of the day, I think, you know, yes, you want to have the basis for support. I think the support out there in the international community already exists. The view of the international community actually reflects the view perhaps, you know, even epitomised within England by Margaret Thatcher, which if that's what the Scots want, then that's what the Scots will get. Uh, the international community, you know, might not have been sympathetic to us at some senior leadership levels, as we saw with uh, with uh, Barack Obama in 2014. But I know privately from other countries that they take the view that if Scotland wants independence, which they're actually very sympathetic to, but won't, you know, won't articulate that because it would uh, it would cause issues, uh, they'll be perfectly fine with that. Ultimately, what we've got to do is to drive it forward here in Scotland. It's not going to be a big boy coming to save us from Boris Johnson. We've got to save ourselves from Boris Johnson. What they'll ensure is that if we start pushing, they'll just say, you've got to sort this out democratically. And these people have voted democratically. And I think then you would find that either negotiations would result in steps taken forward or at very minimum, you'd get a referendum. Don't you think foreign states, talking generally now, would be inhibited about making any sort of endorsement of any kind, because they'd be very concerned about the rest of the UK. Absolutely. I mean, I've privately, have, I've had discussions with ambassadors and indeed senior officials from, you know, government leaders from other countries who'll say, on you go, Scotland, we're really wishing you well. They won't interfere. But that's that's international politics. We've got to win, we've got to win this battle ourselves. There's nobody else going to do it other than ourselves. But, you know, yes, the view from these countries, I won't name them to save them embarrassment, but, you know, their view is, I we'd be delighted. But, uh, yeah, we're not going to interfere with uh what is the internal affairs of the United Kingdom, but we wish Scotland well. What they would do is if, you know, at any stage, something very repressive came in, that's when they would say that that's unacceptable. So as I say, it's up to us to push uh, and they will make sure that, uh, that uh, you know, democracy ultimately prevails, as they would have had we voted yes. You know, first of all, I think Cameron and Osborne would have accepted a yes vote. And had they not, then I think you'd have found the international community would said you can't have it that way. You know, you had a referendum, the Scots voted yes, you got to deliver it. I think the what one of the difficulties at the last referendum was that the parties all agreed to behave themselves and not do anything naughty and not break the rules that they set down. But in fact, the, the no side broke the rules uh, by making an offering at the 11th hour. Uh, it, it seems to me that's always a danger in any referendum where you have you, the, the oversight is vested in one of the parties. <laughs> I think that's that, that, that's an issue there. What to do is disregard all of these things that are coming in, uh, Kenny, because some of them are overlapping, and right. and uh, we'll, we'll go through them in due course as, as appropriate. But uh, it isn't isn't that uh, what you, you you mentioned that there would there would have to be assurances given to other states that the new state wasn't acting in a repressive way to its citizens. The easiest way to do that is to produce a, a draft constitution that you can set before not just the Scottish people, which is hugely important, uh, which is a contract between the, the state and the, and the citizens, but also to reassure others outside the state that the state will behave itself and not act like yeah. the UK just does just now. So has, has Alaba produced a draft constitution? Well, no, but, you know, running up to 2014, you know, we had a white paper that was produced that prepared all that. Uh, Alba's preparing policies for an election. The position of an independent situation is, yes, we support a, a, Scottish, con a Scottish constitution. You know, it's only the United Kingdom amongst a few other countries that doesn't have a written constitution. A written constitution is uh, appropriate for a nation state. Uh, we support that. And, uh, you know, there are drafts out there. Ultimately, they have to be approved by the people of Scotland, uh, whether that's simply by the Parliament and probably arguably also by a referendum, but that uh, that should come. Uh, so, you know, the well, wiser minds and minds have already written all that, and we know we would pre prepared it all in 2014. So, you know, yeah, it's yeah. not that hard. It's uh, just something about keeping it regularly updated, but constitutions tend to be uh, tend to be pretty capable of lasting the centuries. You know, the Americans add amendments to them, but what they produced in the latter part of the uh, 18th century uh, still holds uh, a great deal of validity. They just forgot women and indeed black people. They didn't quite for, they forgot women, didn't quite forget black people. They said that a black person was equivalent to, I think, five eighths of a white person. 
I think that was the calculation. Uh, it looks a bit uh, obscene now, but the, but they were working in the 18th century. I suppose you'd have to give them a wee bit of latitude. Uh, so, uh, so the, 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 I mean, I know back in 2014, Alex Salmond agreed to an interim constitution, which would then be subsequently endorsed or changed, depending on how the Scottish people felt about its terms. Um, and, and it would seem to me that would be an appropriate thing to do again, should we reach that point. Um, can we... So is it your view that, that, there will, that a referendum will, will not be offered, certainly not in the immediate future, so therefore, there would have to be these other measures that you described, the convention, uh, going to the Scottish people, getting the involvement of as many people as possible, and then putting the out output, the result of these discussions to the Scottish people in a, in a form that, what, a referendum would it be, or what form would it take? I think, you know, what, you know, you can't, you know, it's impossible to sit here and say the outcome of the ref convention will be X, Y, or Z. I think you have to have the convention. I think the likely outcome is the people of Scotland would, first of all, declare that Holyrood is sovereign, the people of Scotland are sovereign, and would take it from there. Okay. You would then have plenty of potentiaries uh, who could enter into discussion with the British government to say the Scottish people are not prepared to put up with this. You're sacking people, hiring and firing at will. You're putting our people into austerity. We're an energy-rich country and our people are freezing to death. This is simply unacceptable. We're not prepared to accept it anymore. You know, let's then see what discussions we'd have with the British. If that didn't, then, you know, they didn't enter into discussions. Then at some stage, that's when you might say, well, we're having a referendum, you know, and that's where you would take it out to the people, whether it be boycotted or not, because, you know, you had the backing of, uh, you had the backing of elected representatives. So all these things have to be discussed. What we cannot do is what we've done since 2015 sit here twiddling our thumbs, being told that there's going to be a referendum. I did see, because I know you're saying not to answer, but somebody's saying if we didn't get a referendum in 2023, they're definitely ripping up their NCMP card. There isn't going to be a referendum in 2023. Johnson isn't going to give a referendum in 2023 when there's a UK election in 2024. So you're not getting a Section 30 order. You know, the ability of the Scottish Government to hold a referendum, given that they haven't even put it to a legal challenge, I don't think they need to, but they've not even shown any willingness, but it just isn't going to happen. That's why we need to be looking at gathering together forces for, you know, a convention. It's also, I think, why we need to be making sure that the Yes movement, because the strength in 2014, although we could rest on a government that was popular and indeed a party that was leading in support for independence, uh, the strength was still the Yes movement. I think what we've got to do is to take the Yes, the Yes movement has to take the campaign back it's been taken over by the SNP, it's withered, it's not being allowed to be going forward, and now is the time for the broader Yes movement to take their cause back and to run it themselves. Well, I, I mean, I would contest that on one point, which is that the, the most recent opinion poll suggests that the bulk of the people, i.e. two thirds of, of Scots, don't believe the union will uh, have the, the same form in 10 years time. They seem to be saying that they're accepting that independence is going to happen. This is not a party political thing. They're just, that's well, how they feel. I've seen that opinion poll as well, John. But if you'd asked people in 2015 what's likely to happen, they'd have said something different. And then we were told, well, after Brexit 2016, you know, things have moved on. Things have got worse. I mean, in 2014, I remember doing their hustings. And I used to stand and say how my father had been, you know, a Labour voter. He had detested the Tories. I'd been told he can vote any way you like, son, but he never vote Tory in this household, and it runs deep in my soul. And then, of course, Ted Heath, you know, who had been vilified at the minor strike in the early 70s, all of a sudden he became the darling of, you know, liberal democracy, preserving us from Thatcher. He was the one that stood up for it. And then it went Thatcher, we thought was, you know, nothing would get worse. Then in comes John Major, and he privatises the railways. He was supposed to be some nice but nice guy, and then we got David Cameron, and I would culminate and say, "Who do you think will be next? Imagine it. Who succeeds Cameron? It could be Boris Johnson, to which everybody guffaws, perish the thought. Ha ha! Boris Johnson leading the Tories. Well, he does. You know, if you'd said in 2015, Boris Johnson would lead the Tories, Scotland would be taken out of the EU, nothing would have happened. Folk would say, "Oh, that's not true. No, not true. What? No, 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 no. <laughs> that won't happen. Something's bound to happen in Scotland." So well, yeah, in 10 years' time, let's, let's, if you don't do something, John. Yeah, we're still you, many people watching and listening tonight will agree with you. I, I just want to uh, test the hypothesis, if I may. Uh, let's assume 
and based upon what you've told us that there isn't got, there isn't going to be a referendum uh, in the near future, uh, but there may well be a general election. How are you placed going into a general election in your constituency competing with an SNP candidate? How do you feel about that? Well, we've not got to 2024. We're supposed to be having a referendum in 2023. We are contesting elections in 2022 to drive forward. Alba will decide its position in 2024. But, John, I returned to Parliament in 2019. I did it for one last push. That's why I came back. You know, I came back myself, but I was encouraged to come back, to come back for one last push. Now we're thinking, oh, well, it won't be 2023, and oh, well, we'll have a 2024 election. What happened to the promises of Nicola Sturgeon and of Ian Blackford? How have they taken Scotland forward from 2015? So I don't know what the position will be in 2024, but I can tell you this. The plight of the people of Scotland in 2024 will be diabolical. People will not be able to heat their house. People will not be able to feed their kids. So I don't think it's a matter of saying who's going to be returned on the nationalist ticket will be ALBA or SNP. Because see what worries me in Scotland is a lot of people will say there's no point in voting. Nothing ever changes. We voted Labour. Then we voted SNP. We voted yes in the referendum. And still we get the Tories and still we get shafted. Until we can show the people of Scotland that we can make some discernible change, we can defend them, we can protect them. Because let's remember who voted the most in our, you know, that 2014 election. It was the people from the most deprived areas. They turned out. We're going to turn them off. So it's not about what's going to do in 2024. It's what we do in 2023. And what we're saying in Alba is there isn't going to be a referendum. So let's get that independence convention. Let's get the independence movement together. An independence movement that was together in 2014, that has been allowed to fragment and where any direction and strategy appears to have, you know, been killed off by the SNP. Okay, I want how, how is that going to work? Forgive me. Uh, the May Independence Party has shown no willingness uh, to, to collaborate with you. So you, you organise a convention. The main Independence Party says, shuns it. Where, where does that leave you? Well, I tell you where it leaves me. It leaves me then arguing that the SNP are the problem because they will then have to put forward what is their alternative. Is their alternative, oh, well, we're not able to have a referendum in 2023. We're not coming to a convention. But by the way, we'd like you to vote for us again in 2024. Uh, Please give us your votes. Yet another mandate. So I think that is when people in Scotland and the SNP would have their answer for that. We've got a strategy here in Alba. You might disagree with it. Equally, what is the alternative strategy? We're equally putting out our hand of friendship, which is why in this election we're saying vote ALBA 1, vote Independence Parties 2. We're inviting you, the SNP, to lead the convention because they would. But equally, in the absence of that, I think the Yes movement has to get the show back on the road. It has to unite as best it can to make sure that those who are given a mandate and those who are given political leadership actually do something. Because, you know, from 2015, we have made no progress. A few paltry powers from the Smith Commission are not actually entrenching, you know, the interests of the people of Scotland. So I don't, I can't answer all those questions, John, but I think those questions would have to be answered by the SNP. And if they yeah. didn't, it'd certainly be getting asked by the S by ALBA, because we'll be saying, no, what I, are you I, I, interviewed Mike, I interviewed Mike Russell uh, on the show uh, some months ago, and he was talking about constitutions and the importance of having a draft constitution. Um, I assume that's still underway. Um, and I said to him, would you reach out to other parties such as Alaba and cooperate with them on producing a, a written constitution? And he said, yeah, he, he didn't close his mind to that. Have you been approached? Has anyone been approached in Alba? No, know? I don't think anybody in Alba said any approach from the SNP. Equally, I tend to think a written constitution shouldn't be written by a political party. It should be written by... Uh, by a wider, you know, wider section okay. rather than politicians, you know, uh, and indeed, you know, people have done, made good stabs, you know, at uh, a written constitution, and we mentioned that before. Uh, but as I say, I think the problem is that we're not getting any direction other than platitudes from the current yeah. SNP administration. What, what is your, on a personal note now, what, what is your biggest bugbear as you traipse back and forth to Westminster 
Uh, is it the Tories? Is it the fact that they are sort of re unreconstructed, or is it Labour, or is it SNP, or what? What, what is it that, that what is it that upsets you most about? Uh, I think it, well, I, it's actually anger, John, because I'm in my sixties. I'm a child of the sixties. I grew up in West Lothian in an affluent family. My my life was very privileged, and I'm always born that in mind. But West Lothian was a poor county. We had the mines. We had other things. The economy was in transition. But I have never seen poverty that I'm seeing now. And East Lothian's not the poorest bit of uh, mm -hmm. Scotland. But I tell you, you go to Trinet, you go to the Pans, you can go into housing estates and Dunbar and even in North Berwick, people can't heat their homes. People can't feed their kids. You know, people are going around in clothing. You know, I never remember the poverty, you know, like that, you know, back in the 60s. So that gets me angry because this isn't, you know, this isn't Ukraine. This isn't a global situation. This isn't simply Brexit. This is a political choice. This is an elected kleptocracy that we have under Johnson that has no interest in the people of actually England, never more in the people of Scotland. It's simply about enriching the oligarchs, their friends, their hedge fund managers. That's why they delivered Brexit. And yet those who should be protecting Scotland are not doing so. It's one thing to lay the blame on Westminster, and it does have to go there. Equally, there are matters happening in Scotland in which we are being culpable, and there's nobody to blame but the Scottish government or their quangos or agencies, uh, and that has to be addressed. But ultimately, what frustrates me and angers me is, why are we putting up for this? Scotland didn't vote for it. At every election since, you know, before I was born, we've rejected the Tories, we knew what was happening post-2014. We saw what was happening in 2016. We were dragged out of the EU, finally with Brexit in 2019. And nothing has changed. And that's why, you know, can I, I can, can, can make a suggestion to you why things haven't changed. Uh, uh, first of all, I need to tell you that I'm, I'm, I was born in Broxburn, so, <laughs> so we have a connection there. I also, yeah. want, to, I also want to refer to your... your because you're a lawyer uh, by profession. Uh, uh, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, it's 22 years since I practiced. Right? <laughs> I just want to remind you of the old saying that revolutions don't happen when the people march, but when the lawyers do. Do you believe that? No, I think you. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, there is all a day that the revolutions are driven by the uh, uh, by the, the by, by the bourgeoisie, and many more is more than a song to lot. But I think in Scotland, I think you know we have to get the people out and marching. Uh, lawyers in Scotland, I think, are divided between you know some who are very wealthy and are pro unionist, and others who you know are seeing what is happening and have voted yes and remain committed to the cause. Uh, so I think what we have to do, you know, Scotland won't win independence simply through lawyers. And it won't be winning independence through a court decision that suddenly vindicates it. You know, you use these things, you have to fight in courts, you have to use every uh, array and tool in the book. But what will win independence for Scotland is when the people of Scotland vote for it and when the people of Scotland march for it and when those that they actually entrust in political power actually do what's on the tin and what they said they would do, which is to defend the people of Scotland and force, you know, the claim of right and take it forward. That's what I'm at. that's why we've got to get Scotland moving. Scotland is stagnating. Heads are going down. We've got to get heads up, which is why I do think that it's important that you challenge in any way you can, whether it's arguing about a claim of right or whether it's about going to a demonstration in our growth or anywhere else on Saturday. We've got to show people of Scotland that we're not taking this lying down and that there can be a change. Let me suggest one of the areas where uh, <clears throat> there is a challenge and nobody seems to be uh, confronting the issue, uh, and that is broadcasting. Now, it strikes me that Alaba has suffered more than anyone else by the uh, choices that, that the BBC has made in Scotland about political and other coverage. Um, uh, would that would that not be a target for uh, for you in the first instance to bring about some change in the broadcasting structure that would enable all the parties to be properly represented in its coverage? 
Well, absolutely. I think the broadcasting that we suffer from in Scotland is lamentable. It's not simply BBC, although they are really shameful, but STV has been uh, has been negligent in what it delivers to Scotland, despite giving huge amounts. I saw from a recent uh, article to their uh, chief executive and chair, uh, it's not actually delivering a great deal of work or Scottish content, since those of us who do occasionally look at it occasionally find English games live on the telly when Scotland are playing as well that you can't afford to get... Uh, uh, if you're not on uh, some subscription channel. So uh, it's part of, you know, when I was a government minister between, you know, 2007 to 2014, we argued for the extension of powers. We argued for independence. But in the interim, we also tried to focus the people of Scotland. Wouldn't it be a good thing that we could reduce the drink driving limit? Yes, people of Scotland said. So we tried to, you know, focus on it. So even if people said, well, I don't necessarily want independence, you know, Mr McCaskill, but I do agree we should have a lower drink driving limit. So, if, you know, we acted upon it. We acted upon it in terms of, you know, the situation of air guns and air weapons that were a considerable issue in Scotland. You, 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 I, I can't understand why the Scottish government since you know 2015 hasn't been saying leave aside the smith commission we want powers over broadcasting we want powers over you know energy we want to be able to direct off gen that you know we're not having standing charges double we want you know a change in system they should be asking for these things because it helps to focus the people of scotland so even the people of scotland said i don't really care too much about independence they do care about standing charges they do care about broadcasting they do care about other issues so focus on and actually, the failure of the UK government, the Scottish government hasn't asked for the devolution of broadcasting powers in any recent years. They haven't asked for the devolution of many powers at all, because I ask frequently UK government ministers as a member of parliament that the Scottish government ask for powers, and the short answer is no. And, you know, we have seen a fight about the appointment of Muriel Gray, you know, which is, I think, at least a start. But, I mean, I think the Scottish government should be reflecting the will of the Scottish people, which is that we're really not satisfied. The BBC should have a board appointed by the, you know, for BBC Scotland. Why haven't the Scottish government asked that the BBC Scotland board is appointed by the Scottish Parliament? You might actually get broad support across people who don't even support independence. They might say, well, that seems sensible. If it was the BBC Scotland, it should be appointed by the Scottish Parliament. But yeah. so far, they haven't even asked for that. And so the BBC Scotland board is basically a set of flunkies who have decided in London and then <laughs> direct what we're getting here in Scotland. Well, certainly uh, the opinion poll conducted by James Kelly back in October 29 last year, uh, he asked people, which parliament do you think should have lawmaking powers over Scottish broadcasting? And the answer came back, the UK parliament, 25%, the Scottish parliament, 75%. So it's like it, you're pushing against an open door. <laughs> Literally, you're pushing against an open door. People are yeah. saying the, the present system doesn't work. In fact, I would go further. I think if I was working in the BBC, I'd be ashamed. I'd be ashamed to producing output which I wasn't confident chimed with the wishes of the audience at which I was directing that output. I think that's shameful. I, I, you know, I, I used to be a businessman. I mean, I, I would regard it as being ludicrous for me to offer something to my customers, which they told me in advance they didn't like. In fact, I wouldn't last long as a businessman. Well, can I say that <laughs> one of my best pals from university was actually very senior in uh, the BBC. He's now uh, very senior abroad. And I remember him telling me in the run up to 2014, the overwhelming majority of BBC employees were going to vote yes, because they could see that it would be much better for them in terms of, you know, their future prospects rather than the high road to London or Manchester. Uh, but the directions from the UK government were about how they were to broadcast. And indeed, I remember friend, my friend telling me that neither he nor any other member of staff would be even able to put up a yes poster in their house window. Uh, such was the current of fear that ran through the BBC. That said, you know, I, I don't blame the uh I don't blame the staff because a lot of the staff were voting not just for a better Scotland, but for a better Scottish broadcasting service that they knew would come with independence as opposed to the London broadcasting service that we're getting in uh the United Kingdom. Yeah, well it's it, it's gone downhill fast since then despite absolutely numerous uh, commitments to improve the last uh, head of BBC Scotland, she said that she was, she accepted that people didn't trust the BBC in Scotland, but she was, she was working to improve that. 
I suspect if we did a study just now, we'd come up with even worse figures. In fact, I'll probably do that. I'll probably do that. Uh, I've invited people on the show, uh, the new head of the new Scotland editor. Um, uh, I invited him on the show, and but they run from it. They run from it because, I don't know why they run from it, because it, you, you, I'm sure you're willing to tell us all tonight if I frightened or upset you. I, don't, I try not to upset or frighten people, so there's no reason why they shouldn't come on. Uh, come on and tell us why you think BBC broadcasting should be done the way it's done, etc. Anyway, I'll repeat that offer and hopefully somebody somewhere will... Uh, I've, had, I've, had, I've had meetings with him, Neil Hanvey and I, I think Douglas Chapman joined us. We've had meetings with the guy, he was actually a very personable guy. The problem is they are directed from London, that is it. You know, everything is set from London. You know, they do do stuff, BBC Scotland do do some good programmes. I watched some of them, what's it, This Farming Life, which is actually very good. Equally, you know, the news content is appalling and what you say, uh, you know, they have got worse. You know, the whole, you know, arrangement uh, and broadcasting of Brexit was disgraceful. That was distortion by a government. That was media manipulation, albeit of a very soft sell but it was manipulation all the same. The boosting of Farage, the boosting of Bexit, uh, yeah. and I say BBC Scotland just do what they're tell. Yeah, it's a great pity. And it's not sustainable, I'm afraid, because uh, eventually people, you know, they, 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 they've got, they've got uh, remote control. They know how to use them. Uh, and if you don't provide your customers what they want and need, they'll go somewhere else. And I suspect many of them right now are going to social media and once that trend starts, it starts with young people and gradually extends right across the age groups. Uh, I suspect if we looked at their uh, age profile for their audience, but certainly for news, I suspect we'd probably find it's just people on Twitter or occasionally people in their 60s. Uh, I imagine it, it's not much uh, better than that. Except, of course, when a story about uh, ferry fiascos comes along. Now, the BBC Scotland has described the situation with the ferries as a fiasco. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you have a situation which the last shipyard in the Lower Clyde is threatened, and you have a situation in which communities, island communities, remote communities, haven't been getting a regular or reliable service, not just occasionally for days, but sometimes for a week. It's a shocking situation, and it's only going to get worse because the age of the uh, Carl Mack fleet is... Uh, aging very, very fast, and they're breaking down with regularity. And the tragedy is we have a yard in Scotland with skills. We have a need in Scotland for ships. It's not rocket science to join the two together. And instead, we've got a yard that's threatened, and we've got ships' contracts being sent to Turkey. That's absurd. Uh, and what do you think the eventual outcome will be of this fiasco? I don't know. If we don't do something soon, then I fear that uh, Ferguson's may close and uh, all orders would be going abroad. Uh, what we've got to do is to ensure that Ferguson's remains, Ferguson's is boosted and Ferguson's actually builds, you know, the ferries here. What's gone wrong is simply uh, two things. One, Seamal, uh, who are the Quango, have built the wrong ships, because those that are currently in Ferguson's yard uh, are the wrong type of vessels. Dual fuel LNG with marine diesel are nuts. They're also the wrong type of boat. We should be using catamarans and other things. That's a responsibility of Seamal Equango. And secondly, the contract was tendered far too early that has caused the fiasco. That's the fault of the Scottish government. Everything Jim McCall says about Nicola Sturgeon wanting a big flagship announcement at the 2015 SNP conference is true. You look at the timelines, as I have done. You look at the uh, CMAL board meetings, as I have done, and you see yes. So what happened was that the CMAL were told to give the order to Ferguson's. But of course, nobody knew what the ship was. The contract wasn't fully specified, and that therefore unraveled should the wrong ship, an unspecified contract, the real solution here is to get, you know, Ferguson's yard run by somebody competent, which could be Jim McCall or it could be somebody else. It's certainly not been run competently at the moment, but the workforce are good. And to get the right sort of vessels, which, you know, are plying the waters elsewhere, not those two that we've got there. So the Scottish government has to atone for its sins, get things sorted out, and Seamal, frankly, should be abolished. And do you think the two ships that are being built there will actually see the light of day commercially? 
I don't know. I think there's a real risk that they won't. Uh, you know, this is now years. They're simply the wrong type of vessel. You know, and it's an absurdity. They're an LNG vessel. And of course, we don't even have an infrastructure in Scotland for LNG. It comes ashore at the Isle of Grain, which when I last checked in a map was in Kent. We don't even have facilities in Scottish ports. One of the services was to be open. You're not allowed to have LNG facilities when you're proximate to major urban areas. So you couldn't even put an LNG you know, tank in open. You know, and I also I think I have it on assurances that you also can't use LNG when you're in harbour because it's viewed as dangerous and difficult. And therefore they are in a Baron to Brodick, the Brodick to uh, Ardrossan ferry. You can't use LNG for 30 minutes when you're in Ardrossan or coming out of it. You can't use it for 30 minutes when you're in Brodick or coming out of it. So you've only got about 45 minutes left in the open sea when you can use LNG. This decision to use LNG in the wrong type of ship was caused by CMAL. It's an absurdity, and that has been the problem. They then tendered too soon, so nobody knew quite what the contract was. When Jim McCall said, well, we're going to do this contract because you've asked us to change, we need more money, and eventually Scottish government said, you've got no more money, but Jim McCall's long gone. The ships are still not delivered. They still don't know what they're doing because they're still trying to build something that, frankly, was a prototype. So what we really have to do, there's a Scots guy in Australia builds catamarans that sees all, in, all over the world. It's a much better type ship we should be sailing those ships and we should be getting them in which are after all what the community want because if you go to places like Mull they don't want those type of ships they want what every other country seems to be able to provide that move quicker move faster carry more you know passengers and more people more vehicles rather interesting um is the scottish government doing anything right in your opinion well, I think a lot of the things that they're doing in the margins, you know, I very much welcome. I think on social security, they've sought to mitigate the uh, the situation, the hardship and the austerity, because, you know, the British social security system, security system is institutionalised cruelty. I think they could have gone further, certainly in child maintenance allowance, that's necessary. I think they should also have to be targeting it a little bit more, because although I'm a great believer in universal benefits, I think the level of hardship being felt by people is now too much, which is why the uh, the support given for uh, uh, for uh, uh, to help you with meeting energy bills shouldn't have been given you know to the likes of me or Alec Massey because we've both got uh, obviously I'm in a I'm in a, a, a D band house in my Dunbar flat. That isn't necessarily we should have been targeting it to those who require it most. But yeah, I give credit to the Scottish government and what it's done to stop the worst excesses of the uh, of the uh, uh, Johnson administration. I think where I hold them accountable is that they don't really have an industrial policy. They haven't really done anything to uh, get the economy on the move. And that's where there's issues. And certainly, as I say, on the ferries fiasco, the buck stops firmly with them. And on renewable energy, I'm afraid, again, the buck stops with them. Scotland should be doing so much better. They've sold off the Scotland auction far too cheap. They failed to specify and protect us with supply chain jobs. And now we have the ignominy of the offshore wind energy being cabled south. One cable's going from Peterhead to, North, Peterhead to northeast England. The other's going from a own constituency from Torness to northeast England. The Scottish government isn't getting a bobby. East Lothian Council isn't getting a bobby. Marine Scotland isn't getting a bobby. Crown Estates are getting something like 8.9 million in licensing fees. And I can tell you, there are no supply chain jobs coming to East Lothian, none whatsoever. We are losing out. And the Scottish government should hang its head in shame on that. So, yep, it's done good jobs stopping the worst of the Tories, but it's not protected us from our industry and our energy being exploited. Is that because perhaps, and um, we've had Ivan McKee on the show. Uh, and I hesitate to say this, but I, I need to ask you the question anyway. Um, is that because we don't have people in the Scottish Government or the Scottish Civil Service who really understand business? I don't know. I think Ivan's very able. I've had discussions with him and uh, I, I put him in, uh, in one of the much more uh, able and better qualified ministers. I don't know what's gone wrong. He certainly seems to have been shunted to the side uh, in some ways. Uh, but there certainly seems to be issues, perhaps, you know, <laughs> I always said I always had the Scottish civil service in a high regard. I was very well protected by my people. Equally, when I look at uh, Leslie Evans, <laughs> I have to say, I have to say it's gone downhill fast. Equally, it's not rocket science, John. 
you know, if we don't have the staff here, why didn't we go to the government of Norway and say, could you give us a smart person on secondment? And if they wouldn't give us somebody on secondment, it's not rocket science to go to them privately through, a, mm. if need be, through a recruitment consultant to say, the Scottish government would like to hire you. They'll double or treble your salary. They'll give you a nice pad in Edinburgh or the Highlands or wherever. You know, come and work with them for a couple of years. The yeah. people out there, you know, so this is a lack of vision. And that actually comes back to the government because at the end of the day, my experience with civil servants, civil servants will do whatever you like. You know, if you say this is what I want you to do, go and do it. Civil servants had to go away and privatise house sales under Thatcher. And I don't think a lot of them liked it, but they did it. I had civil servants actually who liked what we were doing. But see what a civil servant told the civil servants told me is what we want to know from a minister is what do you want to do, minister? If you say I want A, B, C and D, they'll go away and do it and they'll do it very well. If you say, what do you think we should be doing? They'll go, but that's your job, minister. And I think the problem is that we actually haven't said to them, we want you to go away, protect our energy market. We want you to go away and make sure that we get benefits because there are ways you can do it. Because, yes, energy is reserved, but planning isn't. What about saying to some of these companies, well, yep, we can't stop you maybe coming ashore, but, you know, who's going to build the roads? Who's, so going, to make sure the road? who's going to provide electricity supply? You know, all my experience having been in government for seven and a half years, John, is... See, big companies, they like to be liked by government. So governments might not get all they want. And so if you ask for too much, they'll say, we can't do that. But if you ask for something that's reasonable, they might say, I all right, we can do that. Yeah. How the Scottish government did not manage to say, we are not giving you anything and we're not going to be very pleased at all and we'll be hostile if you don't get turbine manufacturing, even 20 into Bifab, even 20 into Arnish and Lewis, they could have got something. How we've managed to get a situation where we're having hundreds of offshore turbines that will be seen from the coast of East Lothian, the energy's coming ashore, and we've got no manufacturing jobs, that is just, that is worse than the oil and gas. We were ripped off once, and the old saying goes, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, Shame on me. How you got it, you got it right. George Bush didn't get it right. <laughs> ah, I got it. Uh, that's because it's that's because I've been saying it over and over again. I've been nah, speaking to the head of the East Lothian Courier. We are getting no benefit from our offshore wind. The only jobs that have come in East Lothian at the present moment, some outside contractors who are building transmission stations are staying in hotels or local B and B's. There might be a few security guards. That'll be about it because the construction work is going to big, you know, combines who are bringing the work in from the west of Scotland or the north of England. There's no work here, none, no supply chain jobs and no revenue. And I speak to East Lothian's chief executive. She would love to be in a situation that the Shetland Islands had with oil and gas, where you get a ching ching for the oil and gas coming ashore. Why should East Lothian have the energy coming ashore? If it's even 0.01p per gigawatt, we would still be getting something. As it is, we're getting nothing. So who signed off on that? Well, the Scottish government signed off on it. And uh, that's the uh, that's the shameful matter. The cable that's taking, you know, I just saw in a briefing I got from Ofgem I was reading before we came on air. It is the largest electric transmission project in the history of Great Britain. And we are getting nothing, yeah. and we're getting no guaranteed work. That is just incredible. The Berwick Bank project, which is just one wind farm off East Lothian and adjacent to Fife and Angus, produces more energy than every household in Scotland requires. So, of course, it's got to be transmitted south. We should just be making sure that when it's transmitted south, we're getting revenue and we're getting work here. Yeah, that, that seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, what one decision I think the Welsh government and I think the Scottish government have made is that they are not going to uh, utilise the Jubilee book that's being produced. Uh, I, I gather shortly. Do you think they're right in doing that? Oh, I think so. I mean, at the end of the day, the Jubilee book just seems to be, it's, it's just a slight, slightly reduced version of the uh, replacement for the Royal Yacht. I mean, you know, we're just throwing money at 
people that frankly have outserved their usefulness. You know, and that's why Alba's quite happy to accept that the monarch is the monarch and Queen Elizabeth remains the monarch until such time as she passes from this earth. But after that, that's it. Sorry, no more. Okay. The um, We've only got a short time to go, Kenny. Are there any particular messages in addition to the subjects we've been talking about? Any particular messages you'd like to give people? Uh, I think you know, we're obviously you've got elections coming up, but you, you've already dealt with that. Is there anything else that you feel, hey, it's a pity we didn't talk about X or Y or Z? I think we've got to get the message across to the people of Scotland. I like you, John. I grew up when you know nationalism and the Scottish National Party grew when people saw oil and gas coming ashore and we didn't benefit. What we've got to do is to get the message out there. Scotland is energy rich, and yet the Scottish people are fuel poor. We have a renewables revolution. It is a boon fest. It is, as Boris Johnson said, the Saudi Arabia of uh, offshore wind. We're just not getting the benefit of that. People are struggling to pay their electricity bills. If we can say, you know, why do, why do we need independence? Because we're energy rich and we're fuel poor. So I would just ask those listening, buying that message home because people are greeting over their bills. They're not going to be able to pay. And we've got to say to them, how do we change it? We change it with independence because we should be, you know, we should have money coming out of our ears selling this on the e, the European market. The one thing I forgot to say is the Scottish government boasted about how their Scotland auction brought in £700 million pounds or just under. Do you know that a quarter of what the Scottish government put up for auction was put up for auction in the United States? A quarter. And they got... $4.37 billion. We were sold out and sold off. So let's hammer that message home. Scotland is energy rich. Our people are fuel poor. The way to change it is to be in charge of your energy policy and to be in charge of your, you know, the, your own destiny. We missed out on oil and gas. We can't miss out on renewables. Good. Well, that's a good way to end it. Thanks very much. If you could stick around for a few minutes afterwards, Kenny, I'd be very grateful. Uh, we've got another show coming up soon, so I just need to make a few concluding remarks, if I may. Uh, obviously, I want to say a big thank you to Kenny and also a big thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Thanks for your questions. Uh, we tried to get through as many as we can. I think, to be fair, I think Kenny anticipated <laughs> uh, much, of, uh, much of what the questions uh, contained. Uh, as ever, we've got a great line of guests lined up for future shows. Uh, you'll find the details on the Indie Live uh, package. And as you probably saw on the sticker that came up, uh, next week we have uh, Sarah Sellers, who will be talking about uh, a constitution uh, for Scotland. She'll be talking live and taking your questions. And what, one of Sarah's points is that uh, the preamble uh, to the Treaty or Act of Union uh, in, included a prenup, as she puts it, that meant that the Scottish people continued to be sovereign. Now, of course, nobody at Westminster accepts that for a second. Uh, so it will be interesting to hear what she has to say in that regard. So join us next week and we're going to explore that in some detail. Please look out for my column on the Sunday National this weekend. I may get around to tackling the BBC again if, if we've got some space. And uh, lastly, a reminder of British democracy at work. Well, Boris Johnson continues to laugh uh, at the plight of those least off becomes greater every day. Inflation continues to rise, wiping out people's savings. And as uh, Kenny has so eloquently put it, we've got people choosing between heating and eating. Uh, it's pretty much unacceptable. And it looks as if there's absolutely no way of bringing that to an end. It's absolutely dreadful. And uh, clearly something has to be done. We can't have people uh, deciding whether to heat their homes or to feed their families. It's just really unacceptable. And lastly, just another shout out to James Cook at the BBC. Hi, James. I repeat the offer to you. You're the new Scotland editor. Come on the show. Don't be afraid, please. We don't bite. Uh, why would the Scotland editor not uh, come on a show that sometimes has greater audience than some of the BBC shows? Thank you all for joining us. Take care. Stay safe. Look after each other. Good night. See you next week. <laughs>